Well, we have a, a little company. It's staffed by volunteers. We're definitely at the earliest part of a startup, and we're trying to make a difference. Wave energy, or attempts to exploit wave energy, did begin a very long time ago. They really began in earnest uh, during the oil crisis of the 1970s. And one of the problems was that a lot of the devices that were, were built and put out there, they were destroyed when storms came along, and the whole endeavor fell into disrepute. One of the early successes, or you know, promising successes, was one by uh, Stephen Salter in uh, Scotland, and he de developed this thing called uh, Salter's Duck. And basically, these cams would rotate around, and because of their shape, they would absorb a wave without kicking one out behind them, and they were very efficient. The thing, that's prevented, the thing that prevented them from going off initially was a really nice conspiracy by the nuclear industry. It's very interesting. Um, the thing that has kept them from succeeding later on is their complexity and their cost, but, but they're very efficient. They can absorb about 90% of the energy from waves. Energy from the ocean has a couple of different aspects. One is tidal, and I thought I'd introduce that to you uh, here. There's one uh, tidal barrage in the world. It's across this um, estuary in France called Laurence. And the way the tidal barrage works is it's like a dam where they open the gates and they let high tide come in. And then when it's high tide is reached, they close the gates and they wait for it to go out. And then they just use a regular you know, kind of hydroelectric dam configuration to take some of the energy out of that stored up water. It's not very good for the estuary though, but it's very inexpensive power. Um, tidal turbines in general have to be down where the tide is moving, so that means they're underwater. And these are some examples of the, the types of devices that they use there. They're principally turbines of one kind or another. This is a, a very nice uh, tidal turbine that, that I like because it's very similar to our device. Um, they take this hydrokinetic turbine, that's the, uh, the propeller-shaped thing, and it's in the throat of this thing called a venturi tube. And what the venturi tube does is it speeds up the water a little bit as it's passing through and it improves the performance. And they set these down on the sea floor and these have been proven to work and they're deploying them off the coast of South Korea right now. Uh, one idea that was put forward which, which kind of surprised me was the idea of um, putting turbines on the bottoms of underwater kites. These kites are held aloft just like a kite at the beach and they do figure eights. And these guys do the figure eights underwater and because they're going so fast the turbines can get a lot of you know, oomph out of the water and a lot of energy. The problem is the, I mean, as far as I can tell, the problem might be that the wire comes down across somebody and um, that might not be nice. <laughs> so basically, tidal, uh, harvesting tidal energy means going under the water. Uh, whereas waves, which are very abundant and very powerful, are at the surface, and that's the kind of energy that I prefer. Uh, there's a lot of wave energy in the world, and here in California, especially Southern California, we don't always appreciate that. You know, we go out to Newport or something, we look off the coast, and sometimes it's very calm. There are very small waves, but it's actually the fact that most of the ocean um, has very large waves. These green areas you see here, that's where the wave heights are 20 feet, and these areas where it's kind of red and orange, that's where the wave heights are 40 feet. Um, now, the, pro the reason we don't see it in Southern California is because these waves move like weather patterns. So they come up here in a clockwise direction, and then they come down, and they, they're going south, and so we're kind of hidden in the shadow of, of Northern California. But the waves are very, very large, and they have a lot of power, and it's being wasted. And the really neat thing is that if you were to try and take the power of the waves that are just coming up on the shore, the, you know, the kinds of the surfers would use, that amount of power amounts to about three terawatts around the world. If you go out into the sea and away from the shore, the amount of power is about 60 terawatts. And for comparison, the entire global energy budget for electricity is two terawatts. So it's much more than we use, and it's, it's out there, it's free, it's renewable. And, and the interesting thing also is that most of this ocean out here is like the backside of the moon. You don't even have whales out there for the most part. They tend to go along the coast. So you, you're not hurting anybody when you take that power. Um, now I'll show you some of the wave energy devices out there. And some of them work on land, some near the shore, and some far out. This is one of the ones that is currently enjoying some success, and it, it operates on the land. So there's a big part of it that's back here on shore, and then they stick these paddles out. And as the waves come and push them up, it compresses these hydraulic cylinders and they get a lot of power out of it. And it's pretty inexpensive and it's pretty nice, um, especially if you're gonna use it on a breakwater. You don't wanna do this in a nice area though where you destroy you know, an ecological area, but, but for some areas this is very nice. 
Um, this is another device. Uh, this is called the Oyster. And basically that, that, vertical, that vertical thing right there, that moves back and forth with the waves. And as it does so, there's a cylinder down here and it pumps pressurized seawater up onto shore where it's run through a turbine. And I mean, it's, it's a nice system. Um, it's in the surf zone, so it's not, you know, it's not gonna scale uh, very far, but, but it's, a, it's a pretty efficient system. This is another system that operates very near the shore and it's uh, also using the back and forth motion of the waves as opposed to the up and down. And these are, these are kind of uh, big rectangular fans. So as a wave comes in, they bend like leaves on a tree. And when the wave retreats, they bend the other way. And again, they pump pressurized seawater up onto shore where it can be converted into power. This is an interesting system. This is the Archimedes wave swing. And basically, it's like an air bubble trapped underwater. And as a wave comes over uh, one of these devices, you've effectively increased its depth. And so you've increased the pressure, and the bubble contracts. So as a wave comes over, as a wave peak comes over, these things go down. And as it passes and the trough appears, the, the water is suddenly less deep. And so the bubble expands and it goes back up. One of the problems with underwater systems like this, though, is that if something goes wrong and you have to fix it, then you either have to bring it up or you have to go down to get it. And so that means the cost of your energy is going to be very high. <clears throat> this is an interesting system. Uh, this is the anaconda. It's a rubberized tube. And again, it's using that, that pressure differential that, that follows the waves. So under the areas where the wave crest is happening and there's high pressure, it compresses, and under the troughs, a little bulge appears. And as that bulge moves down the tube, it gathers momentum. And at the back end there, where you can barely see it, there's a turbine and a power takeoff, and it captures some of that energy. But again, it's underwater. It's made out of a flexible material, so it's going to have some maintenance issues. This is one of the, I think it's fair to say, one of the two leading systems under development today, it's the Pelamus. Um, I've told my friends, and I don't mean to be negative because that's a bad thing, but I don't know how this got off the back of the napkin because <laughs> this, this is 100 meters long. It has four, four steel tube segments that are 10 foot in diameter each. And in between each of these is a hydraulic power takeoff, which is very, very complicated. And what happens is this thing floats on the surface, and they keep it pointed into the waves. And as the waves pass these segments buckle, and as they do, they pump hydraulic fluid. Uh, the problem is that when you're up on the surface like that and you're bending, then when a storm comes along and the waves have about 40 times their normal amount of energy, uh, things start breaking. Uh, even great big, you know, one foot diameter steel hinges break and they snap, and that's bad. Um, <laughs> this is the second generation of that device, and I, I know it's being redundant, but I'm still amazed this thing is still going forward. <laughs> this is 150 meters long, and it has five segments now. And, and if you look down here, this is inside one of the hydraulic uh, units. And it kind of reminds me of an Apollo spaceship. You know, it's, it's very complicated. One of these things, this big, it, it costs, you know, this is on the order. We're talking about five million, maybe 10 million each. They don't give the numbers, but it's very expensive to build. And it generates about 200 kilowatts, which is not very much. So. Enough said. This, this is a new device that is based on the principle of the original uh, self-winding wristwatches. And this, this weight here spins around this axis here, and it's, you know, it's off-center. So as the, as the boat rolls, so does the weight, and it generates power. And they make the hull in a special shape so it doesn't just go up and down with the waves. It tends to rock around and everything. Um, that's pretty interesting. This is a very common, this one's based on a very common theme, which is that it's called an oscillating water column. At the right side here, this, this big old part of the structure is, is really a hollow air-filled chamber. And it's open to the water down below the, the water level. And as waves come in, the water rises and it compresses the air inside of here. And as, it, as the waves pass, the water falls and it, the pressure drops. And what happens every time the air pressure changes, this thing back here that looks like a jet engine has air either rushing out or rushing in. And this thing is, again, this is a venturi tube shape, which I'll explain later, and it, it kind of speeds up the air. And so the turbine's located here, and that's how they're getting their power out. And you know these are pretty inexpensive. Um, most of these have had a lot of, have had problems in the past because when the storms come, they tend to be sitting in shallow water and they just get you know, broken up and battered. But it's a nice idea. Um, this is an interesting one. I, 
I just put it in because it's so novel. Um, if you've ever seen those flashlights that you shake and they have a magnet on a spring inside and that's how you build up the energy for your flashlight, this is the same thing. They took that and they put it inside of a buoy. The problem I foresee with this is that waves are gent you know, gently rolling and so they're gently going up and down. It's not a very vigorous shaking. So I wouldn't expect much power. But. And this is, um, I'm sure, the, the leading device uh, under development right now. It's called the power buoy. And it has two pieces. There's a central spar, which is free floating. Um, but because it's so narrow, it doesn't tend to go up and down with the waves because its buoyancy doesn't really change that much because it's, most of its buoyancy is in this vertical thing here. And it also has what's called a sea anchor at the bottom. Um, and then this outer donut ring goes up and down, and that's what drives the power. Problem is, in storms, of course, the donut ring is being slammed around, and, and uh, it's also a relatively complicated device. And this is another one of those devices with a donut shape uh, called WaveBob. After 40 years of effort, we still don't have commercial scale power coming out of the sea. And one of the consequences, of course, we're burning fossil fuels to make electricity, and we're also burning them in our cars. And both of these could be solved with renewable power from the sea. Um, you can actually use the renewable power to create uh, ethanol, methanol, gasoline, things like that. So it would be good if we did that. Um, and what difference would it make? Well, one thing is we'd, we'd help stop the acidification of the oceans and we'd save money because uh, the wave power can be, uh, at least with our device, harvested very inexpensively, um, uh, less expensively than, than it costs to generate power with coal and uh, oil. And here's our device. And this is what they call the capital cost. That's how much it costs to build per kilowatt. Those other devices I was showing you, most of them are $10,000 to $20,000 per kilowatt, whereas ours is $400 per kilowatt. Very inexpensive. And each of our devices generates about, will generate about 500 kilowatts in, in uh, three meter waves. Um, that big Pelamus system I showed you, remember, that was uh, about 200 kilowatts. So we do a lot more power with a much smaller device. The thing that our device does, which is interesting, uh, is it exploits this difference in wave motion at the surface versus the motion of the water underneath. Um, scuba divers will already know this, but wave motion um, is a circular motion and it falls off exponentially with the depth. So when you get down to a depth of about 50 or 60 feet, there's really no more wave motion, uh, if you're in very deep water at least. And so our device is a rigid structure that floats on the surface. So we have a buoy and we have a submerged tube and the, and the tube is attached to the buoy by these rigid struts. So this whole thing moves up and down as a unit. And as it does so, the submerged portion is being driven up and down through still water. So the energy of the waves is, is being used to drive this up and down through water that's not moving. And the thing that really makes it cost effective is our use of a Venturi tube. And to give you some context, a Venturi tube, some of you may be old enough to remember, carburetors. And carburetors worked by having air sucked through a Venturi tube. And one of the consequences of that is that the sideways air pressure falls off. So when you squirt some gas in, it's like you're releasing it from the space station. It goes and it just goes everywhere. And then when you slow that back down, you've got a nice homogeneous mixture of air and gas. Well, we're using the other aspect of entry tubes. Instead of that sideways pressure, we're using the forward increase in speed. And it's a trade-off. Um, energy is not being created or destroyed. What's happening is pressure energy in the water that's moving through it is being converted into forward speed or kinetic energy. The reason that's useful is that hydrokinetic turbines respond to water speed only. And so we can get a very efficient power takeoff that way. So our device, as it's going up on one, you know, as a wave is lifting it up, Pressurized water comes in, it speeds up, and it drives our turbine. And this is very analogous to a kind of um, turbine that's called a, um, a react. I'm sorry. Pelton. Yeah, the Pelton turbine, but that's a cat it's a category. But I, I'm oh, impulse turbines. Yeah, I'm sorry. Impulse turbines take pressurized water and they put it through this this uh, nozzle, which is a venturi tube, and they squirt it at a wheel. And these things are very efficient. And we're doing the same thing, just in a different format. And, and again, the reason this is, this is useful is because we take that, that, that energy, which is um, largely pressure energy, and convert it to speed. And then we can use a very inexpensive and reliable hydrokinetic turbine to convert it to power. And power for these turbines is proportional to the cube of the speed of the water. So when we increase the speed by 10, we get 1,000 times more power per unit area. So it, it turns something that would otherwise not be economical into something that is. 
and our device is very simple. We have three moving parts. We have a, a turbine, a shaft, and an alternator up inside the buoy, and that's it. Everything else, the shell of the buoy and the shell of this is just made out of cheap materials like ferro cement or some other uh, material. And the only parts that are moving are those, are those three. Uh, we did a, a test of this device off the coast of Ventura County, California. We tested the, um, the tube to make sure it would behave properly, and it did. Uh, we measured the speed and uh, everything. It worked very, very well. And that proved the concept. That was what we needed. And here's a picture of the device we tested. It actually had extensions on here, but I, I made this in my garage. Um, these are trash cans I bought at Target, and this is a, a flower pot, and this is another flower pot. And this yellow thing here is a pitcher um, for serving drinks. And, and it seems it's some d industrial design thing to keep these things on this very nice angle, which is what I wanted anyway. So, uh, so anyway, that's what we tested. And this is the data we got, and it showed the water coming in going at this speed and the water going through the throat going at this speed, and that's what we wanted. And when we do an analysis, a very conservative analysis, mind you, of, of our costs and, and how much our energy will cost, we, co we come up with this levelized cost of energy, which is how people discuss these things, where we're at two cents per kilowatt hour. Um, natural gas and coal, which are used to make electricity also, they come out at about uh, seven and nine cents. And you, know, you get into these other things, and other wave energy devices tend to be 50 or 60 cents. So we're feeling good about how competitive we'll be. And here we are in this curve where you have um, power generation cost and capital cost here. We're this guy down here in the corner. So we feel good about that. And it has a lot of applications. Um, generally, you, you build farms of these. You, you send the power up onto the shore to a coastal utility, or we supplement the power of offshore wind farms. And we can also provide power to offshore oil rigs. And the reason for doing that is because since they're so far from shore, they just start burning diesel and, and nasty things to make their power, and there aren't really any environmental restrictions. So if we give them a renewable alternative, that'll help. There are things that we need if you want to help. Uh, a, well, we need places to build the bigger prototypes. I built the smaller ones at my home. Uh, somebody who's good with simulation, that would be nice. Um, people to help with actually building the, the next prototype we want to build, which has a, um, actually has an alternator and, and generates power. And we're, we're certain that once we get that and we have that out there generating power and people see that it's reliable and it, and it really works, that we won't have any trouble getting grants and getting this off the ground. Um, because we, once we're out there, we don't think the other people will be able to compete with us and this will be a great solution. And uh, as always, you know, <laughs> if, we need money, but uh, who doesn't? And uh, a turbine expert would be nice. And then here's a video that was put together by our friend Emmy, and showing our device going up and down. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.